spews out from the bowels of the earth. It's like a scene from the earliest days of our planet. New land is being created. This is Hawaii, where two of the world's most active volcanoes thrust bare land from out of the sea. These islands are the children of the volcano goddess Pele, islands born of fire. The Hawaii we see today is the product of 70 million years of volcanic activity. More than 2,000 miles from the nearest continent, it's one of the most isolated places on Earth. But these towering cliffs are both a beacon and a refuge, an oasis in the vast Pacific Ocean, where global migrants that have traveled great distances across the open ocean come to shelter for six months or more. The lava flows are shrouded by a fog of hydrochloric and sulfuric acid droplets. These fingers of incandescent rock at temperatures of over 2,000 degrees flow into the sea and cool rapidly, solidifying into dark basalt. It's a haven for giants. Three to five thousand humpbacks visit these islands at one time or another. That's about two-thirds of the population in the northern Pacific Ocean. And it's here that the females come to give birth. A humpback mother carries her baby for nearly 12 months. And now, in these warm, subtropical waters, her calf is about to enter the world. These protected bays and coves in the lee of the trade winds serve well as whale calving grounds. Up to 300 whales are born here each year. This newborn is a female. Weighing in at a ton and a half, she's quite a baby. Just after her birth, her mother nudged her gently to the surface to take her first breath. During her first hours, her mother stays beside her, for the baby must keep close to the surface and needs her support. Before long, she starts to play. But play for this baby whale is not all fun. It's a lesson in survival, a rehearsal for life as an adult. Humpbacks have the longest pectoral fins of any whale. When slapped on the surface, the sound travels far underwater. Baby tries as best she can, but she hasn't yet got full control of her flippers. Her mother shows her again. 
It'll be a while yet before the young calf perfects her own technique. But her mother patiently continues the lessons. The calf is about 13 feet long and growing very fast. Feeding on her mother's fat, rich milk, she'll put on about 100 pounds a day. Mother and baby touch one another frequently. The calf depends on her mother not only for nourishment, but also for protection and guidance. This is how to proclaim your presence. Tail slapping. Mother demonstrates. But if you really want to make a big splash, there's a better way to do it. It's a behavior known as breaching, when half the body or more is clear of the water. To do it well, a whale needs to dive below and take a good run at it. For the calf, this playful exuberance helps to develop skills that'll be important when she grows up. Her adult colors have yet to appear, but when they do, she won't be the same color all over. Blotches of white on her flippers and tail will give her an identity that's hers and hers alone. These features are recorded by a team from the Hawaii Whale Research Foundation. They're out here to get photographs of flippers and tail flukes, and Dr. Dan Salden is one of those behind the camera. Around me, I'm going to need to have visual lines to get these flukes. Okay. In terms of our research, the fluke identification photograph is the key. Humpback flukes are like a human fingerprint in that no two are exactly alike, sometimes as a result of injury, sometimes simply genetic variations. Uh, each fluke has a different shape, different markings, and they range all the way from flukes that are virtually all black to flukes that have a great deal of white in them. The identification is based on the scratches or marks that appear in that fluke, as well as patches that may exist where those patches are and so forth. So we analyze those photographs pretty much the same way that uh, uh, humans analyze human fingerprints to identify who humans are. The photographs of flukes and flippers help scientists track each individual across oceans. Wherever it goes and whatever it does, scientists will know who it is. The young female's flippers are mostly dark. But this male calf has mostly white flippers. When he grows up, he'll have the longest limbs in the world, up to 16 feet long, a third of his body length. White pet guy, there's another one right over here. Yeah, this white pet one here. I think that's him. These huge flippers may seem cumbersome when the whale is moving slowly, but they enable it to make tight turns. This maneuverability gives it an advantage over other inhabitants of the sea that might do it harm. There are sharks here, many of them. Gray reef sharks patrol the drop-off into deep water, but they're only a danger to a whale calf if it's injured or sick. These 
sharks normally catch fish, and mainly at night, so they're not a threat. Whales, though, threaten each other. Far from being a gentle giant, a bull humpback is extremely aggressive and demonstrates his power by slapping his chin on the water, head lunging. Those adult humpbacks that congregate around the Hawaiian Islands that are not giving birth have come here to mate. The waters offshore act as a vast undersea theater many miles across in which the leading performers, 45-ton humpback whales, show off, powering through the sea at 15 miles per hour. The young female's mother is not yet ready to mate, but she's gained an admirer, and mother and baby are shepherded away from the danger zone by the new escort. At least eight, at least eight. There is nine, I see a ninth one right there. Nine? Okay. Bulls arrive from all directions. There's going to be a fight. My concern is yeah, that we don't get ourselves in the wrong spot. If we're in the wrong spot, we could end up getting hit. Another female is the center of attention. She's the one with lighter skin color and turned up tips on her tail flukes. Pheromones in the water indicate she's ready to mate and the bulls know it. A large bull moves in. He is the primary escort. He blows a cloud of bubbles, which obscures the female from the other males. But she's attracting quite a following, and the bulls jostle for the best position right next to her. The primary escort emits a huge burst of bubbles from his mouth. Some here are juvenile males. They haven't a hope of shifting the large bull, but they're here to learn. The primary escort uses blocking tactics to keep the other whales out, butting the others with his barnacle-encrusted head. There's one right here off our bow coming at you. The watching scientists are thrown suddenly into the thick of it. The female uses their boat to shield her from the fighting bulls. Eventually, the fighting stops. The primary escort has retained his position next to the female, and when she's ready to mate, he has a chance of being the father of her next calf. The other males separate into smaller groups and drift away. They space themselves a half a mile or so apart. Some just hang in the water. They seem to be resting, not at the surface, but 30 feet down. They hold their breath not for 10 minutes, like the more active whales, but for half an hour or more. Their behavior, or lack of it, has prompted scientists to call them breath holders. Some whales hang in the water with their heads pointing down, and then they do the most extraordinary thing. They start to sing. The songs, like bird song, 
have repeated patterns, and they go on for 15 minutes or more. And every male in Hawaiian waters is singing the same song, a song that somehow gradually changes through time. Some singers attract a listener. Scientists call him a joiner, but it's not clear why he's there. Maybe he's a young male, just hanging around, listening and learning. The maestro and his pupil. The white-flippered calf not only hears the songs, but also feels them. The lowest notes are so loud and carry so far underwater that they reverberate through his entire body. One day, he'll be a singer just like them. But for now, he stays close to his mother, venturing no farther than 25 yards away at most. A large bull stands off. He's guarding the mother and her calf from other males. If he senses them moving in, he hides the female behind a dense trail of bubbles like a smoke screen. He's not the calf's father. He's simply waiting patiently for an opportunity to mate with its mother. He'll have a long wait. The female won't be ready to mate again for another year. But he's very protective. And he's sensed danger. They're false killer whales, one of the ocean's top predators, and they're out hunting. They're chasing mahi-mahi, or dolphin fish. One takes refuge under the research boat, but it will not be safe for long. False killers sweep the area with pulses of high-pitched echolocation sounds. With these, they track the fish's every move. But rather than eat it, they seem to play with their prey like a cat with a mouse. The fish is disoriented. It all appears to be a game. And maybe it is a game, but one with a more serious purpose, a means by which young false killer whales learn how to kill. A group of smaller cousins have dropped by. Spinner dolphins. They're the most energetic species of dolphin, and they've found something bigger to play with. It's the young female humpback calf. Spinner dolphins rest in bays close to shore by day, and come the evening, they gather together to go hunting in the open ocean. That's when they spin in the air. It's a roll call, a way of saying, I'm ready, now it's time to go. Their habit of riding the bow waves of boats probably started by riding the bow waves of whales, and here they are doing just that a free ride. But they'll soon be on their way for a night's fishing. A manta ray is fishing for plankton. Also the staple diet of a drifting salp, a living tube of tiny creatures that live and feed together. 
But the food here is not concentrated enough to satisfy a humpback whale. While they're in these subtropical waters, the whales rarely ever feed. So while the calf is gaining weight, her mother is losing it. She hasn't fed for over four months. The food that whales like, in the quantities they need, is gathering two and a half thousand miles away. It's time for the whales to leave Hawaii. The calf and her mother are at the tail end of a long procession of humpback whales, and they're all heading north. Their departure doesn't go unnoticed. Since people first arrived, the whales have been an important part of Hawaiian folklore. The whale's blow is ha, the breath of life, and the whale itself is kohola, a creation of Kanaloa, one of the four great gods of Hawaii and deity of the oceans. Everything in the natural world Mountains, waterfalls, sharks and whales has great significance in Hawaiian legend. And when the whales depart, they're following the natural rhythm of the seasons, inspiring a sense of renewal. Spring finds the whales scattered across the ocean, but they're all heading the same way. One theory suggests they're guided by the Earth's magnetic field. Tiny particles of iron attached to nerves in their brain act like a compass, and it's extremely accurate. During the first third of the journey, the whale's heading is within one degree of magnetic north. So the humpbacks follow their mental map of the northern Pacific Ocean, and it leads them directly to their traditional feeding grounds. The calf gets a little help along the way. She's pulled along in her mother's slipstream. Swimming at a speed of two to three miles per hour, their non-stop journey may take up to a month and a half. They're going to Alaska for the summer. Carved by giant glaciers, Alaska's Pacific coast is a land born not of fire, but of ice. At the climax of the last ice age, 20,000 years ago, the ice here was part of a gigantic sheet that stretched across North America. About 10,000 years ago, much of the ice melted and the glaciers receded leaving a landscape of ice-carved mountains and valleys. On the coast, it left deep, steep-sided fjords and a labyrinth of bays, islands and inlets. This is the Alexander Archipelago. More than a thousand timbered islands and rocky islets off Alaska's southeast coast. Today, the region is a sheltered resting place and fully stocked food store for about three to four hundred humpback whales, many from Hawaii. For the young female, everything's about to change.
Born into warm, clear waters and a world of competition, she has now entered cold, rich seas where whales work together to make the most of the bounty. The young, white-flippered male has also made the journey. Each whale announces its arrival, and waiting for them is another group of scientists. Mothers and calves will not go unnoticed. They're now part of a Pacific-wide study to find out where humpbacks go and what they do. And maybe why they do it. Inland, the surviving glaciers scrape over the underlying rock, grinding it into fine sediment containing vital nutrients that are carried right down to the sea. It's part of a natural cycle that eventually produces a superabundance of whale food. The glaciers are one reason the whales come here and not someplace else. Huge blocks break free from the ice cliffs, generating waves up to 10 feet high. Some bergs fragment at the base of the ice cliff, over 600 feet underwater. They're called shooters because they shoot up from the depths. They become part of the berg ice that is scattered across fjords and bays. Their ice crystals have been imprisoned under millions of tons of ice for thousands of years. They're so compressed, they refract light in such a way that the ice appears a bright sapphire blue. The melting bergs join the convoy of ice sculptures drifting south. They're trapped in the Alaska coastal current that will take them to oblivion. But before it disappears, the berg ice provides a resting place for harbor seals. They haul out on the ice to drop their pups and to molt, safe from predators such as killer whales. They're part of a food web that, because of special conditions here, is unusually rich in marine life. Fresh water from the melting ice brings with it silt rich in nitrates and phosphates. Strong currents and highly oxygenated upwellings stir up the bottom sediments, fueling blooms of plankton that sustain small fish and shrimp-like krill, food for humpback whales. This whale blows a small net made of bubbles, which concentrates the krill in a tight ball so that the whale can swallow it in a single gulp. The krill is so thick, a humpback might swallow 2,000 pounds of it in a single day. While the Hawaiian scientists were observing courtship, the Alaskan biologists focus on feeding. Cynthia De Vincent of the Intersea Foundation has documented feeding behavior for the past 30 years. She was one of the first to reveal that humpback whales in Alaskan waters cooperate when they feed. Well, lateral lunge feeding is employed where there are some whales that come up in a vertical orientation and others on their side. Whales are targeting out whatever prey species is in the greatest quantity where they are. For the whales that are feeding on krill, when they roll over on their side and take great long scoops, the krill is close to the surface of the water and that's the most effective means for consuming that prey. Sometimes we'll see a second whale come and join the first whale that's coming up and we call this echelon feeding. 
The first whale creates an upwelling that brings the krill to the surface. The second whale benefits from that. The young whales don't take part in this, for they're still taking mother's milk. They remain some distance away, so they don't interfere with the fishing. This female is behaving in an unusual way. She looks to be spy hopping, the way humpbacks look around at the surface. But Cynthia de Vincent believes that this performance is actually a unique way of feeding. She rises vertically out of the water with a mouth full of krill, perhaps using gravity to assist with swallowing. Then she sinks back down and takes another mouthful. In nearby Chatham Strait, small groups of whales work the shoreline. Large migrating shoals of herring congregate here after spawning, and the whales round them up and catch them. A fishing party has found the main shoal and signals to other whales by slapping their flippers on the surface. They also breach. It's an invitation, perhaps, to join the feast. Whales in the distance appear to respond. The group is almost ready. The mother and calf are late arrivals. But something else has heard the commotion, something far more sinister. They're orcas, true killer whales. The humpbacks sense the orcas are not far away. They become agitated and chin slap, the aggressive display that might intimidate the killers. Orcas have been known to attack and kill vulnerable whale calves. Mother humpbacks and their young gather into a bigger group. There's safety in numbers. But one mother and calf have become isolated. It's the young male with the white flippers. The mother's powerful tail could be used as a weapon if she needs one. But the attack never comes. The killer whales head in toward the coast. They're chasing salmon. The humpback calves are safe. With the danger past, the humpbacks go on their way. Some gather into feeding groups of about 10 whales. In Hawaii, the whales were aggressive toward one another. But in Alaska, some groups worked together. Calves separate from their mothers for a short while. They could get in the way. The young female goes to play in the kelp beds not far away.
The fishing's begun, and they're about to behave in a way that has only been observed among humpbacks. They form into teams, and each whale has its own place and role within a team. When all the whales are at the right depth, one whale starts to blow a huge ring of bubbles. The reflections and noise from the rising bubbles scare the fish. They're trapped inside a slowly rising wall, a bubble net. Another whale emits a very loud, high-pitched feeding call and the shoal of herring is driven into a tight ball and pushed toward the surface. Each whale takes a great mouthful of fish and seawater. They force out the water using their sieve-like baleen plates and swallow the herring. Then, one by one, the team dives down and they do it all over again. Okay. When bubble netting, the whales are extremely vocal, <laughs> and doctors Fred Sharp and Sean Hanzer of the Alaska Whale Foundation have been analyzing the sounds and working out who is making them and why. To learn more about the cooperative feeding, we're interested in the aspect of the behavior that has to do with the communication. And we think the communication can shed a lot of light on the feeding process. For instance, during social foraging, we uh, believe that the animals give off this feeding call. It's a very long, loud, powerful sound. It is probably serving to manipulate the prey and aggregate them. We find that a lot of feed calls tend to be right around 500 hertz. That's a fairly low sound, but it seems to be fairly consistent we may be able to start telling individuals apart by those individual differences that are occurring in the calls. Time and time again, the group dives and resurfaces and entire shoals of herring disappear in a single collective gulp. Finally, the feeding stops for a while. Exhausted, but with bellies full, the whales make for still waters in the secluded bays of Inside Passage. It's time to rest. Time to regain the energy needed to feed again. The whales must feed well, for come the winter, many will not feed at all for four months or more. Like giant logs, they lie almost motionless on the surface. A resting group, an afternoon siesta. And monitoring any move they make is Cynthia de Vincent. It's not uncommon that we see sleeping whales in the middle of the day, and it seems as if when one whale starts to sleep, it doesn't take much to set others off, and they all go to sleep. And sometimes you can look around, and everywhere you look will be these islands, and they look like islands big behemoths sound asleep. They just hang there, almost in suspension, with their dorsal fin up, almost as if they're balanced, with their rostrum, their head, just beneath the surface of the water. And an automatic reflex brings their head up, and the blowholes have delicate receptors that detect the surface of the water 
and cause them to open to take a breath. Mother and calf rest just below the surface. One half of their brain remains awake while the other half sleeps, so they're always alert to danger. The humpbacks gorge on herring and krill throughout the summer until the season starts to change. As winter approaches, the snow line descends almost to the water's edge. Stellar sea lions weave among the feeding whales. They seem to steal food almost out of the humpback's mouth. The young female hangs back from the feeding groups. She won't join in completely until next spring. Nevertheless, she takes an occasional mouthful of krill while she's being weaned off her mother's milk. By September, the whale's food supply is dwindling. Most of the surviving herring shoals have moved into deeper water. The fishing is not as productive as it was in early summer, but a few whales keep at it. The calf plays for the last time in the chilly Alaskan waters. Ahead lie at least four winter months when there is very little food here. Mother and daughter are almost ready to head back south. As winter takes a firm grip on southeast Alaska, Dan Salden arrives from subtropical Hawaii. He's here to compare notes and photographs of flukes and flippers with Sean Hanser of the Alaska team. He's finding that not all Alaska whales go back to Hawaii. Well, we finished some collaborative work with other researchers in what we call mark recapture and you analyze the total number of fluke identifications you have and how many of those are recites, animals that you have cited before. And we've learned about movements of the populations, uh, interchanges that take place between winter ground areas and summer feeding areas. Uh, humpbacks have a place where they love to go to eat and basically they will go to that place until such time as the food moves and then they'll follow the food. And they're very faithful to those areas, just as they're very faithful to their breeding ground. But we found they weren't completely faithful. Uh, we've had at least eight animals that have switched between Mexico and Hawaii. And you begin to gather a glimpse of what the big picture is all about. And that big picture is a North Pacific population of some 6,000 whales that spend their summers on feeding grounds in Alaska and their winters off the coasts of Hawaii, Mexico, and southern Japan. Some of the whales don't leave at all. Perhaps they're juveniles or older, non-breeding whales. They don't bother to migrate. The remaining whales are joined by huge rafts of long-tailed ducks. They dive deep to chase the krill, down to 250 feet or more. Whales and ducks are in competition for any food that's left. 
but the ducks will soon migrate too. With most of the whales gone, the summer research comes to an end. The whales are heading south. It's November when the first whales return to Hawaii. For mother and daughter, the journey south was uneventful, and they're both in good health. The young female is not a calf anymore. She's doubled her length since she was born, and is eight times as heavy. The young male with the white flippers is back too. He's been abandoned by his mother and is seeking the company of other whales. There's also a noticeable change in the behavior of the young female's mother. Some distance away, a bull humpback makes a beeline for the older female. He can't see her yet, but he can hear her. And all the other males in the vicinity have picked up the low-pitched sounds she uses to talk to her daughter. As they get closer, they know that now she is ready to mate. The fighting started almost the moment she arrived. The primary escort moves alongside the female and defends his position. The fight ends as suddenly as it began. The large bull dominated the opposition and won the contest. But the yearling is left behind. Her mother and the large bull are some distance away, and they don't turn back. The youngster waits, but the two whales do not return. She's utterly alone. She calls, but there's no answer. Her mother has gone. Now she must fend for herself and put to good use all that she's learned during the past year. But she's not alone after all. There's another youngster here. He's been abandoned too, and like the young female, he's calm and inquisitive. Even juvenile whales find time to play, but play with a purpose. They rehearse a courtship ballet. All around them are the other whales, singers and non-singers, escorts, hangers-on, mothers about to give birth, and yearlings like the young female herself. Like any young beauty, one day she'll be chased by the boys, courted, and won over.
Then she too will become a mother with a calf to teach. Together they will embark on a journey from Hawaii to Southeast Alaska, from competition to cooperation.